Whoa. Okay, hello. So welcome to week eight. I am the question master today. Um, so after reading the article, I have some questions for you all. And my first question is, how do you think the behavioralistic model fits in today's classroom? You want to go, Jessica, or do you want me to go first? <laughs> Doesn't matter to me. <laughs> um, okay, I can go first. Um, so I think that luckily we're starting to shift away from the behavioralistic model. Because um, when I was reading it, it said about where that's where teachers are in schools just to teach the concepts and students are there just to master it. And I feel like we're kind of moving more towards, um, I think it's a constructivist approach where students are kind of taking control of their own learning. Um, and yeah, and I think that's, kind of like a better way to do it because they get to um, take control and decide what they want to learn and take it in the direction that they want to go and that's interesting to them um, while still meeting the expectations and I think yeah. that yeah. yeah no I agree and like I don't really think it has a big place in today's classroom but I think unfortunately it's like how a lot of us grew up and like our program in itself is trying to move away from it as well, but like we still get a lot of information and a lot of knowledge kind of just transmitted to us still. And like, that's okay. Cause there is a place for that. But like Katie said, I think we kind of need to move away from it because we want students to be playing more of an active role in their learning. We don't want them sitting there being passive. And we, in the same way, we don't want teacher candidates sitting there being passive, right? We don't, and that's not how our classes run anyways. <laughs> um, but it also, like it, they were talking about how it limits teachers autonomy and they're saying curriculum development as well, which I think was, is like a huge thing and something I've been thinking a lot about lately is just cause, and I know we're gonna talk about it in our later question, but um, like teachers should have a say in our instruction and we should have a say in like what gets taught in my personal opinion. And with the behavioristic model, that's not what happens because it's kind of just about teaching the curriculum and just transmitting that information, which is what I think we're trying to get away from. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and I think it makes it more interesting for the students too. Like instead of just having someone talk at you, like you're actually getting to take control and learn what's important or interesting to you. Mm -hmm. It's more beneficial, I think. Completely. When have you ever retained any information when somebody's just like talking at you exactly teacher then sounds like the teacher from charlie brown the wah, wah, wah. yeah oh, that's what i always go back to okay next question in the article the writer spoke about how we focus on planning for the cultural and social context in which we teach however it also states that in doing this we ignore questions regarding cultural specifics and how students experience important historical events how would you plan so you hit all the markers, but stay unbiased about different historical events? It's a long question. That's okay. Um, when I was reading that part, like that was actually kind of my first thought, like them basically saying like textbooks and companies who make the curriculum documents, et cetera, et cetera. We're all trying to standardize this way of learning and this way of thinking. And we're doing that because it's supposed to make it easier, easier for teachers to teach but then you're completely ignoring like the different social contexts and cultural contexts that students have because no student is going to have the same cultural and social experience as another student. Like they're very personalized. They're very individualized. So mm -hmm. that was just something that's really struck me. But in terms of like how to stay unbiased about teaching those events or teaching those like social, like teaching about events in those social contexts, um, I think what's most important is just making sure both sides are always heard or all the sides are heard. So as a teacher, like I would never approach a topic like that. Like, for example, if we were speaking about, I don't know, like, let's say we were speaking about police brutality or something like I would open it to the floor of the students because I want all their opinions to be heard, not my opinion to be heard because my role as a teacher is to be that unbiased person and to make sure that students have like a holistic view 
of whatever topic we're talking about, not just talking about one side. Because if we only ever talk about one side, then like we're, we just like, we're, it's biased. It just is biased. And yeah. I think that like, just lastly, like when we're talking about history in general, um, I think history is very biased and the textbooks that we use to teach history are typically very biased because a lot of the Canadian history textbooks that I grew up with never talked about residential schools or indigenous perspectives. So I think we're getting away from that, but yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. I was going to say the same thing. Like, I think it's important to let them make their own opinions and have the platform to say what they feel about an issue and I think our job is kind of just to give them the facts of it and have both sides presented and then have them make their own um, opinions on how they feel about it and yeah. Mm -hmm. No exactly because like for example like you're going to have students who come in to your class and who are like we're talking about LGBTQ plus people you're going to have students who come into your class and be like no there's only this gender and this gender like yeah. the spectrum does not exist and like that's because that's what they've learned previously and you can't just shut them down and tell them they're wrong because then you're limiting their potential to learn and grow mm -hmm. so like that opinion needs to be heard but it obviously needs to be heard in a respectful way and they need to be presented with the facts so that they can make more informed choices and decisions knowing all of the facts because they might only have access to some of the facts at home and not all of them exactly yeah that's a big thing that happens in the school it's like when you're a kid and you hear your parents talk about something you're gonna believe it until you're blue in the face because your parents said it and you look up to your parents but sometimes they're very one-sided on their views or are not educated on both sides and then it's our position to like you both said lay out the information and if they want to continue believing that then that's what they want to believe but you've done your job in educating them on both sides yeah and if, like I think the biggest thing for me is that if you have a student like that like staying on that same topic if they choose eventually after being presented with all the facts to not change their beliefs that's okay but what's important then is to teach them about being respectful of other people's opinions and respecting other people who might identify that way. So like, even if you don't personally believe that someone can identify that way, you need to respect them yeah. as a person and a human being. And just like, you have to at least at a bare minimum respect and understand. Mm -hmm. Right. And like, that's, I think where we play the huge role in like getting students to understand that. Yeah. It's that extra piece. It's the extension of that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Our last question. Do you feel it is beneficial to use management pedagogy and that teachers need to be in unison for different schools and student populations? Um, so I said yes and no. Like, I mean, I think it's good to have kind of everyone, um, in the province, for example, like they have these set expectations that they have to kind of work towards. But I think it's also really, really limiting because um, it's kind of like you're expected that you have to meet those and you're not, I mean, as teachers, we're gonna have complex needs or different cultures in our class. So I think we need to, there needs to be that leniency where we can adapt it to meet their needs and um, yeah, make it so that they're getting the most out of their learning, even if it doesn't meet the standard or like the expectation that everyone else is trying to meet. Because it can be really limiting, I think. Yeah, and I kind of said the exact same thing. So I thought about it in terms of like equity and equality. So when we're talking about like creating those standardized textbooks for like students across the province, that's an example of equality because everyone's getting like the same thing but then you're missing that piece about equity. So like some, like some of the examples might not make sense for students that you're teaching in a certain context or students who come from a certain culture. So it's helpful, like I agree, like the curriculum, like it's helpful to have those standardized ideas of like, this is broadly what you need to teach and what is expected. But at the same time, like 
that's not going to be applicable to every single situation in my personal opinion like you're gonna have you're gonna have to like kind of mold the curriculum to fit your students needs your school's needs whatever it may be so I don't actually think teachers I think teachers should stay in unison and like broadly with the curriculum but at the same time like that's not equitable so like as a teacher I think like I would never teach exactly the same way Katie would teach and like we're not all robots like we don't all teach the same way like we bring our own things to our own classrooms so having that diversity so that we can meet the needs of all our students is equally important Mm -hmm. and there's going to be some days where things happen and you can't get through that lesson Mm -hmm. exactly well yeah and like even just sorry sorry yeah even just like if they don't get it like you have to stay with it like stay with that student maybe for example and like help them through it and instead of just moving on because you need to meet the expectation or like meet the next um the next lesson to finish your unit in time like i think yeah it's important to put the needs of students first instead of just trying to yeah. stay in unison with everyone else Well, yeah, exactly. Like the curriculum is a good starting point, right? Like this is like broadly what I need to teach. Mm -hmm. But then like, if we're looking at the social studies curriculum, for example, and you're looking at just early societies, like as a teacher, you get to choose which early societies you want to look at. So at least there is that piece in there where you can differentiate and like choose what will best suit your students and their interests so that you're best supporting them. So I think it's really just like, it's all about a balancing act. Like, I don't think we all need to be exactly the same way because if education was standardized, then I think we would all just be robots. Exactly. Yeah, I agree. And then the other thing is you get into like, when you get into the complex needs classrooms and things, um, they're only, they're only mandatory subjects as math and language, really. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So then you're not getting all of those other subjects. So it's not you're not unison at that point either exactly and education in a sense should almost be personalized like when you get if you choose to go to university or you choose to go to college like we choose to do different degrees and different programs right so like it's so why does it have like I get kind of why it's standardized before then but at the same time it shouldn't be exactly the same across every single classroom exactly I agree (laughs) On that note, thank you for tuning in.